I'm coming, I'm sharing it, one minute. All right, let me get the link. I've gotten the link. I'm coming, I'm sharing it, one minute. All right, let me get the link. I've gotten the link. Okay, please stop writing. Stop writing on the chat so that people will see the link I'm pasting. Stop writing on the chat. I've sent the link. Please share it around. I'm giving us uh, five minutes to share it to everybody. Stop writing. Stop writing on the chat so that people will see the link I'm pasting. Stop writing on the chat. I've, I've shared the link. link. Please share it around. I'm giving us uh, five minutes to share it to everybody. Stop writing. Stop writing on the chat so that people will see the link I'm pasting. Stop writing on the chat. I've, I've shared the link. link. Please share it around. I, I hope uh, you got the link. Please, can you indicate if you got the link? I shared it now. So be watching. I write it. No, I've shared the link. Let me share it again. I'm sharing it here on the chat. On the chat. I've shared it. That's the link. On the chat. Check the chat. Oh, sorry. I think I was sending it to one person. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right. I've shared it now. Let me share it again. I'm sharing it many, many times. I'm sharing it many, many times. So please copy and paste your uh, fellow friend. I will not start until somebody from YouTube in the case on YouTube chat that they can hear me. That's the link. I'm still waiting. Okay, can anybody from YouTube confirm that he or she can hear me? All right, all right, all right. So let me give three more minutes for many people to join. Once a while, I will be making a noise so that someone joining on YouTube wouldn't be wondering whether the YouTube is uh, quiet or muted. So if you're entering YouTube, you can just say hello on the chat. All right. Okay, I'm still waiting for more people to write on YouTube chat to tell me that they can hear me. All right. Okay. I can see people are hearing me. Okay. The next one minute we will start. The link, you can also copy it and keep for yourself. Assuming you are knocked off from Zoom. So you will know how to quickly connect to YouTube. So store the um link to yourself in case you are not off. Let me share the link again. This is the link. Uh, let me try and paste it also on YouTube. I've pasted also the link on YouTube chat. All 
All right. Let me raise my hand a little as a sign before I start talking. So in the next one minute, we start. Okay. Um, now, those on YouTube, check. I want to change to the second page. Check whether yours will change. I'm changing to the second page. The second page starts with what is a computer program. Check. Did yours change? Those on YouTube, did yours change to second page? What is a computer program? Yes, it did. Okay. So let me go back to the first page. There will be some time, time lapses between those on Zoom and those on um, um, uh, YouTube, YouTube. But uh, it's being recorded. So at the end of the day, we'll be able to share the recording, both on YouTube and on Zoom. All right. <clears throat> For five minutes, I will put on my camera. After the introduction, I will now remove the camera so that the video will be going smoothly. Remember, I muted everybody. That's why you cannot hear each other. And I think it's the best decision because if I leave it to turn into um, Barrega Market. So let me keep everything muted until I'm through with most of the things. Right. All right. Um, good morning, class. Um, my name, some of you must have known, is Dr. Anthony Wohiri from Computer Science Department. Um, and I have been one of the lecturers that has been taking you on FSC 113. Introduction, introductory computer science. This is lecture seven. And if you checked uh, carefully, you would notice that um, our lectures have been corresponding with the chapters in your book. That's on the textbook, computer science textbook. Chapter one is lecture one, chapter two is lecture two, chapter three is lecture three, etc. So today we are going to look at chapter seven. All together you have chapter nine. So I will take you through on chapter seven. It's a very short lecture. Then next week, chapter eight, uh, Mr. Bass will take you on chapter eight. So once told me once before the strike, that this chapter eight might take two uh, weeks. So I don't know whether he's still holding that view or whether he will just do only one chapter, one week for that chapter eight. And then after that, we do chapter nine and that will be all. Now it will be rude for me to just start lecture. So that's why I said, let me make some introduction. Before I go on, please let me again view my YouTube to know whether guys there are following. Please, can someone on YouTube tell me that they heard what I said about chapters and lectures corresponding? Chapter one is lecture one, chapter two is lecture two, et cetera. Can someone on YouTube, not on Zoom? All right, thank you very much. Now, um, I'm addressing you all now before we move on with lectures. First and foremost is uh, I welcome you all back from strike. Uh, we, we are forced to resume. So let me just keep.
Hello? Okay. Sorry, they took light. They took light and uh, my internet connection fell. So I had to quickly try to switch on to my own internet. So if you can hear me now, please let me know both on Zoom, but especially on YouTube. It's very dark, so no need to uh, on my camera again. Very, very dark. But provided you can hear me, we are good to go. Okay, those on okay, um, Zoom, you guys can hear me. So what of YouTube? Can someone hear me? Yes, you can hear me now. And someone again indicates on YouTube that you can hear me. All right, all right, all right. Now, um, let me start where I stopped about general information to everybody. And those on YouTube, assuming you stop hearing me, try to let someone on Zoom tell me because my eyes is on Zoom. My eyes is not on YouTube. When I start lecture, I will not be looking at YouTube. So if you write message there, I might not see unless someone can put a call to me. But if I don't know the person, I might not even pick when I'm in lecture. Okay, uh, let's move on. Let me share the screen again. Now, the general information I wanted to give is one. Uh, welcome back to uh, from Strike. Most of you really enjoyed the Strike. Uh, when I saw some of you, you are looking big and healthy, very, very healthy. So we are frowning. Why are you frowning, sir? Why did you call off the Strike? Now, you should have waited till next year. Trust me, if we had waited next year, you will also say we should have waited till next week. So, uh, uh, sorry, next two years. So uh, we had to call it off. Someone is writing, they can't hear me. Can you hear me? If everybody can hear me, a few of you can't hear me, that means the fault is from you. So sort, of, uh, sort out your problem. Don't just wake up and say you can't hear me. Sort out your problem. So my, many can hear me. So if you can't hear me, it's your fault. They've brought lights, but I will not change back. Once I change back, now it's delayed. So let's just be managing it for now, my own uh, network. Yeah, people are saying you can hear me. So if you can't hear me, please try and find a way to solve it. It's not from my own end. Let me go. Now, first, you received a, an announcement, or will I call it notification, about getting the manual, the textbook, computer science textbook, um, and uh, doing assignments on social so, so pages. On, sorry, on a page. You are given to do three assignments. You do it on your workbook, and you are expected to submit only workbook. Make sure you put your details on the workbook. Your details are your matric number, your full name, your department. Submitting individually is not allowed. You must submit what? Through your course rep. Your course rep is the one that will now bring it for, every, for the entire class to the designated paper. I think Mr. Emmanuel and one other person in the second floor computer science building. Course rep, if you are listening to me, please make sure that when you are collecting, you have your what? Your, um, uh, what do you call it again? Attendance sheets, where you write the names of those collecting and let them sign. Because at the end of the day, we have been into this business for a long time. We are just new. You might not understand. You might not know. You will just be collecting. It's my friend. I will remember. <laughs> Before you know it, you might not remember. You forget. Um, someone is saying that they don't know anything about the program. I'm coming. Um, you collect for everybody as Mr. A is giving you his or her workbook. Let the person sign on the attendant that they submitted. Because when you, come to the, when you come to the computer science to submit, they will ask you of that attendance. And in front of you, you two will count the number of booklets you brought, whether it tallies with the number of uh, people you indicated that collect that submitted. And then for your own little information, cost reps, you can do a photocopy for yourself and keep photocopy of that uh, attendance you are submitting. Trust me, time will come during exam or after exam. Someone gets F. And he or she sees that uh, he or she got F because of not submitting the assignments. They will come to you. 
If you are the one that will carry the headache, they will come to you to say, but I submitted, I submitted. Ah, didn't you remember when I was giving it to you near the toilet? Didn't you remember when I was giving it to you under the staircase? Didn't you remember when I was giving it to you at the market? <laughs> and fights will start. We've seen such every year. So make sure you have the attendance. When they say they gave it to you, you said, okay, you bring out the attendance and check. Okay, you see, you did not sign. That means you did not give to me. But if the person's uh, name is there, then it is now a problem. You have to come to the department and say, sir, this person did not see and see he, re he received. Then the sir will bring out the attendance, the original attendance you gave me and check whether he received. So that's why I say you should have your photocopy and keep for your own personal use in case someone comes to say that he or she submitted and it was not recorded. Yes, there could be um, um, errors sometimes because it's being handled by human beings. So maybe someone submitted action genuinely and so one word or the other it got lost. But we don't really have such because we make sure that before we release results, we look at the, those attendants, make sure that all the people there indicated that are submitted got their marks and their workbooks are there. That's number one. Number two is in the um, notification given to you with respect to the project, some say they don't know about the project. No problem. Um, ask your course rep, they will share it. Maybe those asking it are the batch B or the new students. But it's not late. The assignment was shared just yesterday. So calm down. You are not late. It was just shared yesterday. And you are giving, I've forgotten the date, I think at least one week or so to do it. So calm down. The book must, I repeat, must be bought at the bookshop or at our computer science building. Where at our computer science building? At the ground floor, ground floor, not first floor, then second floor, ground floor. Immediately you approach the department, you do as if you are climbing down. When you get down, ask anybody. But the little here is the room is always open. The door is always open. So when you enter the ground floor, check your right at the end of the corridor. You see a door that is always open. As there, that's where they will sell you the uh, textbook and the workbook. Two of them go together or at the bookstore. In the notification I wrote there, preferably you get it from our department because at the bookstore, from the information I got, they have very limited number, quantity. So you don't go there, they say it's finished, you now start coming here. But once you come to the department, 100% you get it. The amount is 4,000 Naira only. No, it might be hard for some people, but as your lecturer, I will advise you strongly to get it. Um, please, oh, for those that always like uh, uh, reporting, sir, they are asking money from us. It's, it is not Dr. Woe asking money from you. You are not paying anything on my hand. You are coming to the department or to the bookstore. So it's official. And um, it's not compulsory. Someone was asking me the other day, sir, if it is not compulsory, but if you if you don't buy it, you don't get a uh, score in CA. Yes, but let me tell you now, the CA is over 30, right? So that means if you don't buy the textbook, and you get 70 over 17 exam, you are scoring your A. You are getting your A if you don't buy the textbook. And uh, the main thing is, Ogao, go and get your 70 over 70 <laughs> in exam. And uh, nothing like that, they will enchant us. No. When you are buying, as though that have bought, nobody wrote down their name. If you come and say you want to buy 20, or yeah, oh, if you have your money, buy the 20. If you want to buy only one, fine, buy one. Nobody's writing down names as they do in some state universities, write down your names and they will not start using it to reach hunt people. No. Come buy, if you want to buy for your friends, fine. Nobody's writing your name. So as you see me here now, I don't know who bought, who did not buy. But don't do the mistake of being outside to go and buy. We've had that every year, we always complain, but today we're not here. People will plagiarize our book. The selling, I don't want to call the place so that they will not sue me. But they will be selling it near somewhere in this school, and uh, people will just go and be buying because officially sold 4K. Some people will just go and do it, make the color to, um, sorry. Someone was asking for transcription. No, it will delay. Some people will just go somewhere where they will sell it to them for 2K, 2.5, 1.5. It's cheap, I know, but there is a mark we check. There is a mark we check, copyright mark we check. And if yours is not with it, then your name is sorry. Your name is sorry because what? 
we will not tell you that your booklets have been rejected, but we of course note it because you will surely come. You will surely come with your call thread to come and say sorry for me. Sorry, and we bring it out and say this thing you did not collect it from here. So please listen to advice and follow um, uh, and follow instructions and keep to the rules and regulations of what you are being told. For batch uh, B students, I understand your predicament. Most of you have not even registered. Some of my students in the medical lab have not even registered. And here we are in lecture seven, where it's not our fault. Uh, <laughs> it's not my fault to start with, but at least for FSC 113, We've come out with a, a plan that will help you a little. I've compiled the videos for all the lectures that we have done before you came in. For lecture one, there is video. For lecture two, there is video. For lecture three, there is video. Lecture four, lecture five, lecture six. YouTube videos of all these lectures. So I will share it. I don't even know whether I should share it through one course rep. We will now take it around. Because if I share it here, now people will use their messages and cover it. I want to share it. So that you can copy it and uh, at your free time watch them each one is louder lecture one you watch lecture two is watch this is especially for the batch b students that were unfortunate not to start on time with others let me before i go forward let me be sure that somebody has been listening to me so especially from you two guys have you been hearing me clearly Yeah, Zoom people are saying yes. Let me hear from the YouTube people. YouTube, uh, somebody hearing me? Okay, okay. Um, okay, I will share it here. Someone said I should share it here and also uh, share it uh, with uh, course reps. Okay, I will share on YouTube, I will share on Zoom. And let us share it with just one course rep. I'm the course advisor for MedLab. So I will share it on the MedLab WhatsApp group. And trust me, they will, you all will get it. After all, you got the link, Abby, the link for this lecture. Did you know how it came about? It is from MedLab students. So they will share it with you. I will tell each and every one of them to share it separately, separately, separately for everyone to get. But let me quickly share the links here. But please don't distract yourself. Don't go now and start watching them. You wait until after lecture. Now, stop, stop writing on the chat so that it doesn't disappear. Let me first write on Zoom. I've shared the links on Zoom. Let me now go to YouTube and also share it on YouTube. Wait, so it's refusing to share on YouTube. Wait, I'm coming. But I've shared it on a uh, Zoom already. YouTube is having issue to share. Wait. Okay, it uh, passed the number of uh, characters I should sh share in a message. So let me share it into two. Let me first share. Okay, let me share lecture one separately. YouTube people be watching. I've shared lecture one. I've shared lecture two. I've shared lecture three. I've shared lecture four. I've shared lecture five. And finally, I've shared a lecture six. Let me once, uh, once more share the whole thing on Zoom. So these are the videos. You click on them, you watch. Don't, no need clicking it, like clicking on them now. You watch uh, for lectures one, two, three, four, five, six. After this, I will also share lecture seven. No questions. Uh, that's my third remark. No questions while lecture is going on. Before I used to do it, but you know why I stopped? Once you unmute, you will hear noise. You will not even know who is asking questions. So I believe you will agree with me that there is no need um, entertaining question here. Rather, if you have your questions, Please write them down, not by chat. I will not see them. Many people are writing. Write them down on your paper or somewhere. Pass it through your course rep. Course rep will find a way to send them to me. 
And when I get when I get them, when I answer, I will also send it to that course thread that sent the questions to me. Please, no need asking questions here. It will take our time so much. It will take our time so much, and people will be distracting and disturbing with noise. <clears throat> All right. Um, somebody said we can't see it. You can't see what, sir. I've, I shared the links. I was sharing them one after the other. It's just that your co colleagues are writing and writing and writing, so it's disappearing. Don't worry, at the end of the lecture, I will try again and share, but trust me, many have gotten it and they will give it to you. I will also share it through the medical lab students. The medical lab students, I will tell them to one by one share it on their different platforms. Yeah, I can see someone sharing it again on uh, Zoom. Thank you very much. Okay, um, all these efforts I'm taking, class have started, lecture has started since, but you see me still here trying to make sure that uh, the badge B students, especially, are okay. It will not be fair, it will not be nice that we just start without addressing their concerns. So I repeat again the badge B. I know most of you, we are not uh, attending lectures from number one, number two, number three, etc. So that's why I've taken my time to gather all these links so that you watch them. Bear in mind, I'm not the only lecturer. So lecture one is another person. Lecture two is another person. Lecture three, I think, is me. Lecture four, another person, et cetera. So take your time, read them. And if you check very well, most of what we are teaching are from the manuals, from the textbook. So make sure you get yours. And of course, for the purpose of doing your assignments, your assignment is your CA. Make sure you get from your uh, from authorized bodies, that is from our department here or from the bookstore. From the department here is down uh, ground floor. You reach the department, you do as if you are climbing down. When you reach down, look your right at the end, there's the door that is always open. I pray that the day you come, it will be open. So that you must say that always say that it's a door that is always open. But you ask around, I want to get manual from that and they will show you. It is 4K, not 4-5, not 3-5. All right. Um, I think that is it for now. Um, let me come in. Okay, I'm checking something. All right, let's start. As I said, the lecture will be brief, so that's why. I had to take my time to address some of uh, these concerns so that uh, it wouldn't be that uh, we left some people behind. It's lecture seven today, which means chapter seven. And if you check on the book, on the textbook, uh, it's not much. So we should be able to cover quickly. I'm introducing you to programming. Um, next week will be the proper programming in Visual Basic. Of course, uh, we are not going to do uh, full-fledged programming because full-fledged programming is only done, you know, in person. You bring computer, the person will sit down, you start teaching the person. But at least the basics uh, you you will learn, and they will appear in the exam. Exam, I think, should be for computer science should be um, CBT, computer based. That's on the system. At um, GLI. And they at uh, social science. Sometimes you take the two venues, but sometimes only at GLI, as the case may be. Okay, let's look at what's a, a computer program. Because the lecture is about, I'm starting lecture now. The lecture is about uh, introduction. We are introducing the programming today. So it will be really able to first know what is program, what's a program or a software, well, or a good before you talk about going into it. A program, um, you can see some definitions and explanations there on your screen, but don't expect in the exam, they will say what's a program and you see the exact definition. I always tell students, make sure you understand what it is talking about. Then in the exam, no matter how we bring it out in OBJ, you'll be able to pick out the correct answer or pick out the wrong one among the correct ones. Because questions could be all of these except all of the above except one. It's not correct. Or uh, all of them are wrong except one. So you'll be able to speak out, assuming you ask what's a computer program. 
So without looking at what's written on the screen, a computer program is just, uh, what I call it instructions, telling the computer what to do and how to do it. Set of instructions, telling the computer what to do and how to do it. It's just the layman's definition. Uh, why I call it layman definition? Someone once asked, uh, if I write instructions on a paper, is it a computer program? No, it is not because the computer will not be able to read those instructions on a paper. So that means the computer program must be in a language that can be understood by a computer, in a language that can be understood by a machine, computing machine. So if you write your program or you write anything there on a paper, on a piece of, on a land, then computer will not be able to execute it. That is, it is not a computer program. So looking at the screen, it said there is a, pro, it's a sequence of simple logical instructions into which a given problem is reduced and which in a form a computer can understand. Okay, let's take the words one after the other. It's a sequence. Now, if you're giving someone instruction, maybe you want to tell someone to go to Ikeja and buy you something at ShopRite. Remember, the instructions will be one after the other. You give the person money for transport. You will tell the person where to get maybe bus or taxi. You tell the person where to drop. Maybe you take another taxi and tell the person where to drop again. When you enter shop, right? Uh, maybe let's say the mall. You will direct the person where to look for shop, right? You know now at the Ikeja mall now you have shop, right? You have other um, supermarkets, other shops there. So you see how you are directing the person. This is just a very simple example, trying to show you what sequence of instructions. The major instruction is what buy me so 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 something at ShopRite. Maybe buy me a shoe at ShopRite. Now the sequences of that particular instruction is take transport from here to here, uh, drop here, take another one if you reach, go to your left, go to your right, etc. Until you reach, you locate ShopRite shop. So it's a sequence, it must be a sequence. It's not any random stuff like that. It must be a sequence. Then logical. Logical, how do I put it to you? Logical means like, um, you know, computer works with logic. Logic is something like, uh, if A is greater than B, to take so, so, so action. If B is less than A, take so, so, so action. If A is equal to B, do this or don't do that. That's the logic. And it is just a very few. Computer is 24 hour performing logic, logical operations. As you are hearing me now, that means your phone or your laptop is performing one or two logic. It's not only the arithmetic uh, logic, you also have, <coughs> sorry, you also have things like comparing and uh, also, you know, computing, shifting, jumping. These are when you are dealing with um, um, binary numbers, zeros and ones. Yeah, but we come to that shortly, but we are not going into it into that deeply. So here I'm trying to, in this slide, I'm trying to explain to you that computer program one is a sequence, is an instruction made up of sequence of uh, logical instructions and uh, must be in a form that a computer can understand. That form is what? Using programming language. You have your Java, you have your C++. Uh, um, apologies to those that are totally away from computer science. But these are programming languages, Java, C++, Python, et cetera. There are many of them. C Sharp, there are many, many of them. So these are languages that the computer must, that the computer understands. Therefore, your instructions must be written in those languages. If you don't understand Japanese language and I speak Japanese language to you, you will not know what I'm saying. I might give you instruction, you will not understand. Therefore, to you, that thing I'm telling you is not a computer program because you are not understanding it and you cannot execute it. <clears throat> okay, a given problem can be broken down or reduced into sequence of simple logical instructions. I've already given you, explained to you what instructions are and what logical means. And don't worry, you will be seeing concrete examples shortly. And secondly, it must be in a form the computer can understand. I hope you are hearing me. Can one say something on YouTube and on Zoom that you can hear me, please?
All right. All right. The Zoom people are hearing me. What of YouTube? I'm waiting, YouTube. YouTube people, oh, I'm, here, I'm waiting. Okay, you can hear me. So let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, so have it in your mind. Don't go and cry. Especially the medical students that all want to pass to the Arab. These are the little, little things that will bring you down if you don't take care. Don't go and cry. It is not in secondary school. Uh, define this. Explain the, the way the questions will come. It will test whether you understand what is a program. Is it something that can be understood by a computer? One can be broken down into little, little uh, uh, instructions in sequence two. Once you have this, you are done with this slide. You don't no need going to burn your midnight candle, reading it and reading it and reading it again. I'm moving on to the next slide, slide three. We are still repeating the same, and you can see example there that a program is simply a list of logical instructions that tell the computer what to do. For our computer science students uh, in second semester or so, of course, we tell them that uh, it's um, logical instructions telling the computer what to do and how to do it. One minute, please. One minute. One minute, I'm with you. All right. I think let me remove the video so that uh, things will be very, very clear. Uh, someone from the water came to me now. So <laughs> you can see the water at my back. So let me remove the videos. Uh, when you remove the video, the audio is very good and it will not be lagging. Okay, program is simply a list of logical instructions that tell the computer what to do. Let's see a simple problem. You know, a problem could be add one plus one. It's a problem to a computer. Multiply this. It's a problem to a computer. Draw a human being. It's a problem for a computer. Now, these are problems. And that computer must be able to break those instructions. No, you, sorry. Giving the computer, must tell the computer how to break those, that problem into small, small, small instructions. And there are one or two characteristics also you see now. So let's look at, if you view the screen, um, we are doing a simple addition problem. We are teaching the computer how to add. You know, computer in secondary school, they say it knows nothing. It only performs based on what you feed it with. Okay. One minute, please. Now, assuming we want to add numbers, the computer must be told to know how to accept the first number. You know, in addition in computer, if I'm, I tell you to add one plus one plus one, I know you just say three. But that's not how computer adds. Computer adds only two. If you add the first one, one plus, if you add another, okay, let me say one plus two plus three. The computer wants to add one plus two plus three to you. If I say, what is one plus two plus three? You draw with your human brain, say it is six. But the computer will first say, we first add the first tense. That's one plus two. It will get the answer. That answer, it will add it to three. As we are adding one plus two plus three plus four to ten, it will add one plus two. It will get the answer. Take it, add it to the next one. Take it, add it to the next one. That's how computer works. In sequence, in sequence, not in random. So it accepts the first number. We call it X. It accepts the second number because you have to know the first. You have to know the second before you talk about addition. Same with subtraction. John. All right, you accept it, accept the second number, then it adds the first and second. And of course, it will also allocate something to denote the answer. Now, assuming, let me come again, it's adding one plus two plus three. It will now say, okay, one will be the first term, two will be the second term. For that moment, it is not looking at three. So if we add one plus two, it gets three. That three it gets becomes the first number again. The other three that we have not added becomes the second number. Let me use another thing so that uh, I cannot confuse you another time. Let's say it's adding a X, Y, Z, Z, X, Y, Z. 
is adding x, y, z. We don't know what they are, but it's adding x, y, z. Now, if we take x as the first number, if we take y as the second number, at that moment, z is not coming into the picture. It has x and y. The answer, let's call it t. So t is the sum of x and y. Now, that t becomes the first number again, while our z becomes the second number. Ask them again, the answer becomes the first number again, it continues to add. So that's how you see in sequence, not in random. So, and uh, the output will be the final answer depending on how many things you're adding. The program should incorporate, I'm reading on the screen, the program should incorporate the logical procedure for solving a given problem. Hence, a computer does not produce logic. It simply follows what is supplied in the programmer's code. See, computer is like empty. It follows the instructions you give it. If you tell it to add one plus one, and you don't tell it how to do it, it will not calculate that one plus one. Yes, today our calculators, etc., are, are, are doing that because they have the instructions already in them. If the instructions are not there, it will not be able to play your video, it will not be able to play your audio, you will not be able to draw your picture or view your picture on your screen. But because what you are doing, you are using a program and that program contains instructions. If you want to play a video now, there is a video app you will open. Let's say on your, your mobile phone. If you want to draw, there is an app you will open to draw. That app incorporates those uh, logical procedures. So the computer does not on its own produce logic or instructions. You are the one that will feed it with those instructions. <clears throat> All right, I move to slide four. And uh, almost all of us have heard the term programming. So programming is the art of writing that program. It's the art of writing the pro uh, computer program. Um, some of us call it coding. Are you coding? That is, you are writing the program. Remember, the program is what instructions telling the computer what to do and how to do it. So when you are writing a program, you say it's expected that you know why you are writing the program. What I mean is the problem you want to solve by writing that program. If you want to write a program that will be measuring the temperature outside, uh, that means you will not end up writing a program that will be playing music. So you know exactly why you are writing the program. Uh, well, we'll come to that. It's called a problem definition. You define a problem and it should be very clear. Okay. And uh, your program, of course, is expected to perform a useful, you know, give a perform something meaningful. <laughs> you not just write a program, ah, Mr. A, what is your program doing? So I don't know, it's, it's just there. No, there must be something you will say with your mind that this is what this program is doing. And that thing must be meaningful. A program that, you know, many things. Open your phone, your mobile phone, uh, open the home screen. You will see many, many, many icons there. They are doing one of Two things. Camera is a, is a program there. Uh, music players are there. Your Binance, all of them are there. They are all programs. Your um, photo editor is there. Many things. Uber, Boots, they are all there. These are all programs doing particular things. If I ask you what is the Boots or Uber program doing on your phone, you will tell me clearly. You will not be saying ah, it's like this, it's like this. You will say clearly what it is doing. It's used for what? Getting a taxi for you and tracing your path. Okay. Programs are written to solve specific problems of varying level of complexity, requiring different level of resources and planning. Varying degree of complexity. Well, this paragraph, what does it mean? It means that some programs solve very simple tasks. Their task is not much. Something like your calculator, it's just to add, subtract, multiply. Why some programs they do by far more complex work? For example, Zoom. See what Zoom is doing? Maybe you are at Ibado or you are at uh, Kano, but you are listening, you are hearing, you can hear me very well and you can see me too when I put the video. So the Zoom is doing much more complex stuff because the code behind it is, of course, uh, much more complex. That's uh, simply what that second paragraph is saying. So a sample program might be to add, subtract two numbers, why another to manage the customer's uh, account, 
of a large enterprise bank. So that's exactly what I was just saying now. If you have a program that is just to add two numbers, of course, you know that that is a very simple task. But if it's something that we manage people's accounts, uh, let's say your UBA app, uh, those ones are performing by far much difficult task because one, security is there, they have to protect your account. Two, you have to authenticate before you log in. Three, whenever you withdraw money from ATN, somehow, somehow your app will establish connection and know that you withdraw money, so et cetera. So that's just explanation telling you that programs uh, solve different kinds of problems of different complexity and using a different level of resources. Resources here is just like the electricity is consuming, the memory it is consuming. As you know, if you are playing a video of high quality, if your laptop is not strong enough, it will start lagging or it will start heating up because the load is high. But if your laptop is good enough, nothing will happen. So if you are watching a very high definition video, it will be using consuming more resources. One, it will be consuming electricity more. It will be making use of your memory. You know, the, the higher the quality of your video, the larger the size. You know that very well. So it will be consuming more memory. It will be consuming uh, electricity. Uh, it will also be making the brain of the computer, which is the CPU, work more. So these are what we are calling resources. So resources are not money you put in your uh, in your pockets. Computer computing resources, the memory, the RAM, random access memory, which you did, which you've done, I think, in chapter three, hardware. Apologies to Badge B. I hope you would uh, check the videos later on and uh, you know, update yourself. Okay, a sample program. Okay, I've, I've said this. We move on to slide five chapter, um, of our presentation. All problems to be solved by a computer must be broken down into four basic operations. Any problem that can be broken down into these um, uh, four basic operations can be solved by a computer. If you have a problem, I can break them down into these four, uh, then it can be solved by a computer. Unfortunately, I will not go deep into the last two shifting operation and jumping operation because it's almost an entire class. So I will just touch them quickly. Calculating and computing, no, the first one. That one is, as you know it, the name is self-explanatory. Uh, that problem does it involve calculations. Computing and calculation is the same thing, it means the same thing. Does it involve one form of calculation or the other? Are there arithmetic calculations to do? Are there logical computing to do? These are um, one, if that your problem can be broken down into this, fine. Second one is comparing and test. You are comparing. Comparing is greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Uh, you have others. There is one, uh, this sign that has a greater than and a, and a less than sign at the same time. That one is called uh, if a number, if B is less than or if B is greater than. These are comparisons. Just check. In mathematics, all the signs denoting comparison. If the problem contains or features comparison, it's fine. Remember what we are saying. We are saying that if a problem can be broken down into these four basic operations, then that problem can be solved by computer. I did not say that uh, that problem can be solved by anything, but by computer. So if you have a problem and it cannot be broken down into four, maybe it can be solved into, uh, by another way, maybe manually by yourself, writing that down on the paper and trying to solve it. But we, we are here saying that if the problem can be broken down into these four basic operations, then it can be solved by a computer. Shifting operation and jumping operation, that one I will just, well, let me paint it uh, easily for you. The two mostly involves working with binary numbers. And I know you guys have done binary numbers. Binary was in chapter um, in chapter information representation. Yeah, it's in chapter six, lecture six. Binary numbers, addition, subtraction, and uh, binary coded decimal. Now, uh, when you are doing binary coded decimal, and also when you are doing multiplication, multiplication sha was not done, and division was not done, it's too high for 100 level. But when doing multiplication and also doing binary coded decimal, you shift, 
Shifting is as you know it. What is shifting? Shifting. Binary numbers are ones and zeros. If you are multiplying a binary number with something, you keep on shifting. You multiply by one, depending on the number you are multiplying with. If there's a remainder, you shift it to the left. When you are dividing two, you shift to the right. So we are not going to that into that deep, but you'll be asking then why the hell are we talking about shifting here? Or why the hell are we talking about binary number? Mr. Man, Mrs. Woman, we are talking about binary number here because binary is the only language the computer understands. And you are told that in chapter six, hopefully, in lecture six. Is the only language the computer understands. Yeah, somebody will raise hand and say, Sir, ah, what of Java? What of C sharp? What of the other programming languages? Those programming languages, yeah, so computer understands them, but not the understanding we mean. Binary are the native language of the computer. It's native language, just like you have your own native language. So the computer has its CPU that converts all those, your Java, your C sharp, your Python, it converts those languages into its own native language. So if you wrote a language in Java, it will convert it from Java to binary numbers. If you wrote it in Python, it converts it from Python to binary numbers before it can, you know, work on those instructions you wrote. So working on those instructions means working on binary numbers. And working on binary numbers involves shifting and jumping operations. So even if anything I'm saying now and you're hearing it, trust me, the uh, CPU, my own CPU, converted it to binary numbers, converted my voice to binary numbers, converted my videos to binary numbers, did additions, did subtractions. Here, subtractions, additions are not one plus one, two. They are, they are additions and subtractions, logical additions and logical subtractions is doing in its CPU, the central processing unit, comparing, jumping, shifting, these are operations. It uh, does. For you to be able to hear me clearly and see me clearly of course when the signals if you convert the binary signals to sitting on your screen now but they came as binary signals and it converts back to voice and you'll be hearing my voice so the operations involved in between are calculating comparing testing shifting jumping operations so that's where i will stop with respect to shifting and jumping operation nobody's going to ask you deep about shifting or explain jumping but know at least that these are the basic one of the basic operations that a problem must be bro broken down into for you to say with certainty that the computer will be able to solve that problem. So as long as this a problem is reduced to these basic operations, it can be solved by a computer. All right. I think let me let me make this. Um, once again, can someone hear me well? Let me be sure that's what I'm being heard. Yes, you can. Okay, you have to give me a minute. Let me go and check. Sorry. The guys at uh, YouTube and see because their own voice comes a little bit late. Okay, anyone on YouTube that can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So let me go back to my Zoom and continue the lecture. Now, um, when you want to develop a software, you know, software is a program. It has a, a cycle. Cycle means the steps you will take to develop the program you want. Remember, before you want to develop a program, trust me, in your mind, you know why you want to develop the program. That why do you want to develop the program is the problem you want to solve. There's a problem that you want to solve. That's why you went to Computer Village, bought your laptop, came back, installed uh, maybe one programming language because you want to write a code to solve that problem that have been disturbing you. So before you start, you have to define that problem. All those blue circles you are seeing, we look at them one after the other with uh, examples. And once we are done, that is it. The lecture is over. The problem division. So let me just call them because we are still going to look at them. Each one has a slide. 
you have to define the problem, know exactly what you're going to do, not like this, like that. You have to say, state it unambiguously, the problem you're going to solve. I want to create a program that can uh, listen to voice. I want to create a program, a camera, that can serve as a camera. I want to create a calculator. You see, it's very concrete, unambiguous. Then is now analyze the program. That's the second stage. You analyze the program. Analysis involves what will be required of me. What, should, uh, what is expected to be done for this problem to be solved? That's about the problem analysis. Then after you've uh, trashed out that, you design a, uh, you create your design a model. In 511 computer science, we, we have a course on computer modeling. It involves um, converting reality into abstract, abstracting reality. For example, you want to build a bridge. It's a problem. Engineer, they'll first create a model, a model, different kinds of model. Mathematical model, of course, is the main one. You represent it in the form of equations. But first, you can also create a graphical model. You draw the bridge, look at how it's expected to be. And you now factor in things like water flow, wind direction. I'm not an engineer, but I'm trying to give you an example. Water flow, wind direction, where the bridge can pass. Oh, there's, uh, there are buildings say it can pass through like this, et cetera. So once you create your model, a computer model, it's not just diagram on a paper, computer model, you run the model and look at the bridge as if you have built it. Look at how it's performing, look at cars, ETC. So this is the model you are designing uh, or creating a model for that problem you want to solve. After that, you now go into developing the code, writing your code, that's what we call by development or implementation. You start you know, writing and uh, coming up with your software. After that, you go into documentation. You know, documentation is, you know, the name there is self-explanatory. Writing down all about the software, everything that was done about the software, how to use the software, the do's and don'ts in the software. So that another person taking that documentation and reading will be able to know how to start and what and what to do. That's about documentation. This is the basic uh life cycle of any software developments any software you're developing at least we pass through this this is the basic ones all right so let's now look at them one after the other let's first look at problem definition and hopefully there are um i try to put in very simple examples very very simple examples your own problem will be difficult examples in the exam my only is to give you simple examples okay problem definition that's the first one the problem must be complete precise and unambiguous statements of the problem to be solved. You have to make it clear, precise, and complete for a third party to see and understand clearly what you are going to do. Um, if you want to build bridge, say that you want to build bridge that will cross from where to where. You just don't say you, don't, you want to build bridge. Do you want to build bridge in my office? Do you want to build bridge um, at the gutter? So you want to build bridge, that's number one, but it's not yet complete and it's not precise. I want to build bridge from, uh, let's say, Liki to Ikeja. Pardon me if you can't build bridge from Liki to Ikeja, but I'm being specific and precise. I want to build bridge from Liki to Ikeja. Where in Liki and where exactly in Ikeja? And in between the two, where are the bridge, uh, the bridge points going to pass, the pillars? How are they going to pass? So you are making your problem precise, complete, and uh, you know, unambiguous. You wouldn't have to come out with a problem that another person will start asking you a question on that problem. Uh, what do you mean? I don't understand. Where will it stay? This and that. So it must be complete and very clear uh, of what you intend to achieve in the problem. Okay, it's a clear definition of what the program does or is meant to do. This is another explanation to problem definition. You have to define clearly what you want that your program to do or what you expect it to do. So we look at an example of, a, sorry, I'm shifting this up. Look at an example of a problem definition. Um, they took lights, but I think on my, on my internet, please, can you still hear me? They took light again. But I think I'm using my own internet. Can you hear me? Can someone, okay, oh, thank God. Thank God I just switched it off. All right, all right, let's move on. Let's move on, thank you. So, um, example of problem definition, see number one there on your screen. 
a program that can multiply two integer numbers. You see, it's very clear. You can't ask me any question there that you did not understand. A program that can multiply numbers. If I if I have said it that way, a program that can multiply numbers. Okay, that means any number, natural natural numbers, but it might not be precise. Reason is if you multiply pi by pi or square root of two by square root of two, you understand where I'm heading to. If we keep on recurring, 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 so it's not uh, precise, but in this example program that can multiply two integer numbers very clear it is very clear there another one a program that can calculate xyz xyz sorry it's like a name of a company any company call it let's say apple a program that can calculate apple's current employee pension you see a program is calculated pension uh, if i had said a program that can calculate pension someone may ask whose pension is it pensioners in nigeria that they are not paying or those in the u.s or is it a company or is it a government uh, for government workers? You see, but we specified it clearly there for a particular company, XYZ, and uh, it's for pension. So this is like an example of a problem. You have defined your problem. Now let's go and do what? Analyze it. Oh, I'm still on the problem, Sha. Okay. Um, we are still on problem definition. It's another example, right? A program that can add the first 10 natural numbers. I think the natural numbers are from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I know in mathematics, some people argue that zero is a natural number, but I think generally, generally, the view in mathematics uh, among mathematicians is that zero is not a natural number. Uh, the natural number starts from one. So assuming um, you don't know how to add one to 10, and you want to write a program that will help you do that. So this is the problem definition. Find a program that can find the sum of the first 10 natural numbers. You have defined it. So anybody you show this, we know, okay, this is the kind, this is what you want to solve. And what is that? That you want to, uh, to add precisely one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Precisely. You are not adding 11. If someone says, but sir, uh, you can add 11, but the problem stays that can find the sum of the first 10 natural numbers so it's as clear as possible now we go to the next one problem analysis if you look on top at the left see this diagram here it's helping you to know where we are see this small small blue it's helping you to know where we are the first one was here this is uh, the problem definition now we are here on the red one the problem analysis so the problem analysis involves uh, examining that problem you examine it and uh, you know know the ins and outs what is required uh, how to break them down and uh, each step what are you expected to take in each step towards solving that problem so uh, it involves breaking down the problem i'm reading from the screen into its constituent parts and determining what is or are needed to solve it that's exactly what i just told you um of course if you are talking about computer and solving the problem through software. Of course, that problem, you defined it. The next thing is, what are you expected to input? What are you expected to give the computer? And what do you expect the computer to give you at the end? So for example, that's our problem of adding the first 10 natural numbers. How, oh, assuming you guys are not many, I would have unmuted and asked you a question of what do you think the input would be? But no problem. If I unmute it, there will be so much noise. So the input would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The output will be what? Okay, someone can write on chat. Let me see what you write. What would be the output for a problem? Our problem is what? Um, we want to uh, create a program that can add the first ten natural numbers. So the output, what, what do you think it would be? Those on YouTube are also allowed. All right. Exactly. Exactly. Who is saying three? Emmanuel, you go give me your matric number so that when exam comes, we will call you for some interrogation. Which one be three? Uh, let me check guys on youtube whether they've answered anything 
Ah, see these people answering the wrong answer. Which one is 55? Okay, you are adding it already. <laughs> okay, I understand you. You've added it already. But I meant for you to say the general answer. As even I say national numbers from 1 to 1,000, will you start adding them? Okay, I'm coming. Let me, someone from YouTube, can you tell us if the problem is to add the first 10 national numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 9, 10. The inputs are what? 1, 2, 3, till 10. What do you think the output you expect from the computer to be, of that program to be? Those on YouTube, can someone bail us out? People are just added. Mm. My friends, so make no fellow. I just play. I say, don't add. Okay, okay. Let me put it this way. Let me see now whether you add. Okay. Our problem is what? To create a program that can add the first 1,000 natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 900, 901, 902 to 1,000. So the input is what? All these numbers. One, two, three. What do we expect in the outputs? Those on YouTube, what do you expect in the outputs when you are to add uh, the first 1,000 natural numbers? Someone on YouTube? Yeah, Esther Green, thank you. So I move on, um, but I will let, let me announce the answer again, okay? so that you wouldn't say you do not understand. Now, check the, if you are looking at the screen, you see the third paragraph. It says, as we are analyzing the problem, you look at what is required, what the computer will need from you, and what you are expecting from the computer. Though the inputs are what the uh, computer will need from you, or what the program you are writing will be needed for it to be able to perform the, uh, and solve the problem you, you want. Now, and I gave a concrete problem. Add the first 10 natural numbers. So the input here, which your program will need is one to the first 10 natural numbers, one, two, three, two, 10. And the output will be their sum. No need adding them. I understand you're adding them. You are right. But the mistake I made, I would have called up to 1,000 numbers. You will not add them now. So the output will be their sum. Then there must be a procedure you have to tell the computer how to get that output. I've given you input. What do you do with those inputs to get the output? That is the procedure. And the procedure, of course, is very, 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 very important. All right, the next slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is the next slide. Um, we are still on um, problem analysis. The first example I gave you was adding the first natural numbers. Now, see another example. So in exam, you can get an example and you are asked maybe the flowing could be the input, except or all these are not inputs, except or the flowing could be the output, except all these cannot be the output, except those kind of questions. Now, there's another problem. You, have to, you want to calculate a company's current employee pension, the pension of a company, the employees. You want to calculate it. You want to create a program that can do that. And of course, trust me, most companies, they have programs that do that. They are, they are not being done manually. If a company is a multinational company and you have uh, many, many, many thousands of employees, you will not sit down with your hand and be calculating people's pension every month. No, you have a program that does that. So the inputs could be the employee ID, his full name, uh, department in that company, designation, employment date, salary, pension, percentage. You'll be asking, why all these? Can we remove some? Well, it depends. You know, it depends on the kind of company you are dealing with. But there is something I want you to pay very, very good attention to on these inputs. The things being listed are the things that really will identify a pensioner. A pensioner that retired 10 years ago and a pensioner that retired yesterday, their pension will be totally different. And you will agree with me. Uh, that is, if their pension will be different, that means you must know the date when they were employed, and you must know the date when they retire for you to be able to calculate. Now, a, someone that spent 10 years in a company and someone that spent 30 years in a company, you will agree with me, their pension too will differ. 
So you also have to know, you know, uh, how long they stayed in the company. And for you to know how long, you have to know when they were employed and when they were sacked or when they retired or when they left. So that's why you see these inputs. I'm not saying that these are the only inputs that is possible or that you cannot remove, but inputs mostly are the, the stops, the items that you cannot do without if you want to solve that problem. So if you, are, if you are calculating someone's pension, for example, you must know the employee ID. The employee ID will identify the person because in a class, in your class, now you might have two, three, four students answering the same surname. And there could be cases where someone is answering the same surname and also has the same uh, name with someone else. So, but employee ID will be unique identifier of each employee or each student in a class. For you now, it's not employee ID, also will be what matric number. If you identify each one of you, that's why we brought out uh, a matric number came about because clearly people will have the same names, we share the same names. And uh, before, if someone was sharing the same name, they use date of birth. But what if <laughs> they have the same date of birth? Because it's possible. You might not have met such, but it's possible. I will agree with me. So the department where the person is serving, maybe those that serve in the sales department, their pension is higher than those that serve in the security departments, for example. Also post, if you retire as a manager, your pension might be higher than if you retired as a receptionist. Employee date, employment date, you know why it's needed. Then your salary, you know, pension depends on salary. It's a percentage of your salary. So if you are any one million naira, your sal your pension is expected to be more than someone who was earning 10k so you see you, uh, the program needs all these variables for it to be able to calculate the pension the output is the pension that's what you expect in the number the amount that's what you expect in the program to give you when you feed it with the input show me the amount of uh, the amounts of pension that each employee is entitled to then the procedure that's actions that will be taken on those inputs. So um, this is an example. I'm not saying that in every company, this is how they relate to their pension. No, everybody, each company might have the way they do their pension. But generally, one, it will depend on the person's salary. Two, it will depend on how long the person has served there. Three, it will depend on the position the person held in that company. The difference will not be how you calculate it what percentage you are doing with the salary. If the person was earning 10,000 naira, maybe pension will be 1% of it. Another company might say 2%. Another company might say 10,000 minus two times, so, so, so amount, you know, depending. So the procedure is the action being taken. So in this particular example, the procedure, we, what we want the program to do is to get active service year by subtracting current date from employment dates. Then multiply the pension percentage to get the pension value. This is just an example. It's just saying that you take the current dates, subtract it from when the person was uh, employed to know how long the person has served, you get, and then um, apply the percentage. You multiply it by the percentage the company is adopting. So don't go and kill yourself to start cramming this now. No, you don't need to cram it, but know that a procedure is involved. And as I told you, procedure is very, 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 very important. Of course, you can also not do without inputs. For procedure to happen, it must have something to work with, which is inputs. And for you to get output, procedure must occur for the program to now give you what you expected. If you look down down on the screen, more examples are available on page 73 of your textbook. Okay, we we'll move on. Um, Another pro, uh, class programming exam example. Um, uh, the same example we are using, but trying to be more specific now. Uh, the problem is to add the first natural numbers. So the input is the first 10 natural numbers. The output is the sum. The procedure is what? See the procedure. Start from the first natural number, which is one. Add the next number to it. This thing is blocking my view. Add the next number to it, store the sum, continue to the 10th natural number. I don't think there is nothing you don't understand here. The procedure is one after the other. We are adding one, from one to 10. So what is it doing? It will take the first one, which is one. Add the next number, which is two. It adds it one plus two is three. It will store the three 
you know, computer works with this memory. You not just be holding it in the air. If you saw that thread, now look for the next number to add, which is thread. See this thread here. So if we bring out the three stored in this memory, add it to this thread, it's six. It stores it. Take six, add it to four, 10. Take 10, add to 15. Add to five, 15. It is it. Until it reaches the 10th natural number. Remember, it, you have already fed it with inputs. That is the 10 natural number. So when it reaches 10, it will not continue to add to 11 because you've already given it what to work with. It doesn't know what is what 11 is. It doesn't know what 12 is because you did not give such input to the program. So you see problem, <clears throat> sorry, problem analysis, how it could look like. Uh, other um, examples could come, multiply the first five even numbers. So you should be able to, with the knowledge you gain now, know what to do and how to apply uh, apply it. Multiply the first five even numbers. Okay, we move from zero, sorry, from zero. Uh, you see, <clears throat> now let me correct myself. You see, the problem was not very clear. Do you see? The problem I gave you now was not very clear. I said, multiply the first five even numbers. Somebody will ask you, where am I starting? Minus two is an even number. Minus six is an even number. Minus 10 is an even number. I'm saying the first five even numbers. Where am I starting with the even numbers? Even numbers are very everywhere, on your left, on your right. So that was why I now chipped in from zero. From zero, you start counting to the right. So the first even numbers there, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. So you see why problems should be specific. Thank God I made this mistake and also you saw it. Why problem was specific? Once I say uh, even number from zero upwards, you know exactly where to start. But if I just say first five even numbers, it is not very clear. And don't compare with this one, we are saying natural number. Natural number, everybody knows where it starts. So nobody needs to tell you from zero or from one. You, you should know what is natural numbers. So natural numbers always start from one. Okay. Let's move on. Now we come to the third one, the model and the design. So before I move on, whenever I change to the next, I'll always ask you whether you are hearing me and whether you're understanding. Can someone hear and understand? Yes, sir. Okay, what of our friends on YouTube? Wait a little for them. YouTube, can you hear and understand? All right. All right. Thank you. All right, you see there is a, a lag in voice. It takes like a few seconds before they can hear what we're saying, but all the same, we are hearing fine. So we move to the next. Look at the diagram again. We are on the third one, the first one, problem definition. The next one was problem analysis. Now you create a model. A model is the abstraction of the real problem and it defines the relationship between objects of the problem space. Uh, let me use the bridge I gave you as an example. Remember I said, if the problem is to construct a bridge, you first create a computer model of it where you can view it on your computer and see how it will fit in maybe in the terrain, etc. Now, listen carefully. Let me use this example and explain what is written there, that it defines the relationship between objects of the problem space. This is the most important thing on this paragraph, in that paragraph, the relationship between the objects of the problem space. Let me use the bridge as an example. Now, remember when I talked about bridge the first time, I talked about wind, direction, and I said I'm not an engineer. So I'm just using relatively what we can relate with. We look at the wind direction, you look at the place that is swampy or where the bridge can stand very, very strong. Um, you look at uh, the terrain. Uh, if there are, how, there are so many houses towards this direction, okay, we shift the bridge like this, we shift it that, that way, zigzag, etc. Now, the objects in this problem space are this wind, uh, the buildings built around, swampy area, forest area, etc. You know, when you are constructing bridge, that doesn't mean that the bridge will always pass through the entire bridge is on, on water. Some areas will be passing on land, remember, and then some areas passing on water. So you look at all these things, and all these things are the objects, wind, 
whether if you do it this way, will it be against wind? That means it will always be subjected to wind pressure. Or if you do it this way, it will be in the direction of wind. So wind will not affect it. You know what I mean. And also where you will place the pillars, whether it will be too close to residential buildings, etc. Uh, so these are the objects and you are trying to find a relationship between them. What's the relationship between the wind and the bridge? What's the relationship between the wind and the houses built there? What's the relationship between the wind, the bridge, and the other policies the government must have uh, enacted? Maybe there is a power plant nearby. Maybe there is a petrol station nearby. These are the objects that matter in this problem space. So you see, you check the relationship between them. Relationship here is not just about, I love you, I like you. It's about how they relate to each other. Whether this will hamper the effective construction of the bridge, or whether if you create the bridge, this one will suffer or it will not suffer. Now, models come into two. You have the mathematical models and you have the logical model. But I can tell you in today's world, you know, mathematics is the mother or the father of all sciences. I know that the masters listening to me now, they will be blushing. But that is true. Mathematics is the mother and the father of all sciences, both chemistry, physics, computer science, engineering, all of them. It's mathematics. So every model, and you can quote me, every model, computer model created today has a strong background on mathematical model. A mathematical model, okay, you can check your page 74. It's all about what? Equations. All these equations, they are mathematical models. But yes, in secondary school, we look at them as just equation. Uh, y is equal to 2x plus 2. Um, Z is equal to t squared minus 1. These are equations, but are actually, they are representing a particular model. Let me give you as an example. Um, what do I take now? Okay, Newton. The second law of Newton. I know that most of you know it. <laughs> I hope so. Apologies to the non-science students here. You can see the finance, insurance students. So don't bother. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, the second law of Newton. If I'm not mistaken, if my, I can still remember very well, it says that the acceleration of a body depends on two variables, force and the mass of that body. Yeah, the one you can is F is equal to M times A. I understand. But explaining it, that uh, the acceleration depends on two variables, and those two variables is the force applied on that body and the mass on, of that body. It's a mathematical equation, and it's a model. It's a model describing what? What is it describing? It's describing force you apply on a body. Now, you see, uh, when it comes to the model now, you are checking the relationship between what? The force, the mass of that body, and the acceleration. You can now see that that acceleration can, depends on the force and the mass. If you want to calculate the acceleration, you must know the force and you must know the mass. If you want to calculate force, you must know the mass, you must know the acceleration. If you want to calculate the mass, you must know the force and the acceleration. If you want to calculate the force, you must know the... Um, um, so if you want to calculate the force, you must know the mass and the acceleration. And if you want to calculate the mass, you must know the force and the acceleration. And if you want to calculate the acceleration, you must know the force and the mass. What am I saying? I'm saying that they are interrelated. So look at the relationship between them. So if you are going to maybe uh, create an engine, a car engine or an airplane engine, trying to calculate the force, then first you have to know the kind of mass uh, the body will carry, that's the car. And the acceleration, the highest acceleration it could have. This relationship. And it's a model. So where you see system of linear equations, which you have done in just SS1 and SS3, system of linear equations, quadratic equations, you know, when you say system, it doesn't mean one equation, it could be five equations as one system. So it's describing a system. And of course, it's called a system of a linear equation. It's describing a system, something that is happening in the real world, a beach or wind direction can be converted into equations. Uh, the way car moves can be converted into equations. Uh, those in the medical area, all those uh, facilities you use to diagnose uh, patients. Uh, most of all, we watch movie now, if somebody's dying, that's a graph, will now become stress. <laughs> that is a model. 
is someone's life a stress line, but that stress line is able, is able to tell you what is happening in the person's body because what happens in the person's body has been studied and a model created for it. And now you can view the model and be able to interpret what is going on or what can go on in the person's body. So mathematical mod, um, model mostly come in mathematical forms. The logical model is like a path. It's also for you to see how the system will work. System here is your problem, how your problem will be solved, how to see it mostly and understand. But the mathematical model is the bedrock that uh, you know, defines exactly what is going on. Okay, we look at um, logic uh, example of logic. We look at flowchart. That will be the last slide we look at flowchart and see what is this. But we'll also look at what's uh, our algorithm, what they are. That is the sequence of actions so to be taken. All right. So let's look at algorithm. What it is? Let me remove this here. It's a finite. If you want to call it finite, no problem. I think. Um, British and America have forgotten. One of them call it finite, the other call it finite. Just like, uh, because I heard some strange arguments. No, it is called, uh, let me remember that word again. Let me remember it. Uh, roots. You know, in computer router. You know, router you used to route the internet for yourself. Someone, they came here, um, um, students for our department. So is it called router or router? But it's so funny. I know we are used to calling this router, but the guy calling it router was also right because router is American pronunciation. Router is British pronunciation. You can check and check on uh, Google. So same with finite. Once call it finite, you call it. Once call it finite, you call it. But I know mostly here we call it finite. So and um, and the algorithm pronounce the way you like. Some call it algorithm. Uh, some call it how the audio is not uh, so uh, pronounced. From ALG, you go to our algorithm. So the algorithm process must be finite. Or it must be a set of rules that spells out a step-by-step -step sequence of operations we follow to solve a specific problem. You have a problem. Now, what are the procedures to follow? Those procedures together make up what we call an algorithm. It must be fine, and that means it must stop. You can't just be doing it and doing it. If you are doing it and doing it and doing it, then you are not producing any meaningful end product output if it is continuous. So that's your algorithm must be finite, it must end. The second one is that it has a steps, and those steps also are definite, cannot continue forever. Step one, step two, step one million, step one million and one, step one million and two, it must stop somewhere. I'm not saying that it must stop at step 10 or step two. It might reach step 5 million, but it must stop. So, and the each step must be clear, precise, and uh, unambiguous. That is, what step one is doing is not what step two is doing. What step two is doing is not what step 10 is doing. You cannot come and meet step 20, and you see that it's doing the same thing with step five, then there is a problem. So each step is unique with respect to what they do, and, and they are very clear of what they are doing. All right. Then, of course, the algorithm must have input. Already know what input is doing, and it must have output. Remember, our algorithm is the procedure being performed. So input, output, you understand what they are. And the effective. Well, effective means that uh, a combination of the above that must be done exactly in a finite time and a reasonable length of time. So it depends on each person to say what is reasonable. Uh, if you are uh, solving a problem in today's world, not like before when we used to have a very big computers occupy the whole uh, building. Today, if you want to calculate one plus one, or if you want to solve a system of linear equations, you don't need to start solving it. And after a month, you get the answer. You see, the word reasonable comes into play here. It's not a reasonable length of time. It takes too much. Uh, it should be what you will solve. And within five minutes, you get the answer. And uh, the steps must be, you know, uh, finite. Must step must end. Cannot have indefinite number of steps to take towards solving that problem. I hope this is very clear, and I hope it is. <clears throat> so let's see an example. Let's see an example. Uh, simple addition. We are adding two numbers: one, two, three, four. We are adding it to five, six, seven, eight. 
is 1,234. We're adding it to 5678. We know how we add it when we are small. On your right, you see how it was spaced out. That's how we always add. Now, see my hand here. I don't know whether I can even draw. I should be able to draw. Let me check. Yeah. Okay. I drew something there now. See, this is how we want to add number, and this is how we normally add it when we are small. You have to add this first. Four plus eight. There is something you do. Okay, let me tell you how I do when I was small. Let me just be speaking the language how I do it. Four plus eight. Um, Twelve. You put two. Carry one. Put it here. Uh, seven plus uh, four. Ten. Uh, sorry, eleven. You put one. Carry one. Put it here. Uh, one plus six plus two. That's a uh, nine. You write nine. Five plus one. You write six. But but we are doing something. We are comparing. But, but as a human, we don't know. We are used to it. Four plus eight. You write carry. But you are, why did you carry? That's the question. Computer you must understand. You must make computer know why did you carry. Four plus eight, 12. Why didn't you write down 12 here? Why didn't you write down 12? You just wrote two. You carried one. Why? So on your left, this is where it's explained. And this is what the computer must know. Once the computer knows this, fine. Any number, it will just quickly calculate. So you arrange the two numbers in standard form. This is the, for us, for us humans, this is the algorithm. Step one. Step two, start with the rightmost column. The right mode, the one and the, uh, the right. Gong gong at the most right. This is it. You start with it. Now, step four. If sum is less than 10, record sum under current column. This is the column we are. This blue. This is the current column. This C means current. This is the column. Step four says if you add these two and the sum is less than 10, just write it down under it. Okay. Step so five says if the sum is greater than 10, subtract 10 from the sum and record remainder. Add one to the column left of current column. This is grammar, but I, I assure you, you know what they are saying. You know what is going on here. What does it say? Uh, add these two. If it is less than 10, you write it down. That's step four. Okay, step four. Let's check whether we can apply step four. Four plus eight is 12. It's, le it's not less than 10. Step four is saying if it is less than, it's not less than 10. So we leave step four and go to step five. We come to step five. 4 plus 8 is 12. It's greater than 10. So what does it do? It says subtract 10 from that 12, write down the remainder, and carry the rest, and can add 1. So what are we doing? 4 plus 8 is 12. Subtract 10. I'm, I'm doing step 5. Subtract 10 from that 12. If you subtract 10, it will remain 2. So we write down 2 here. That was the subtract 10 from the sum, and record the remainder. You get so remainder, add one to the column left of current column. So we subtract 10, the remainder is two. We wrote down two, and we add one to the next column. The next column now is this. This is now becomes the next current column. Remember, we carried one. So we take that one, add it to the, this is four, four plus seven, this is 11. We, we go again. Let me remove this. Just be looking at the uh, look on your left, the instructions. It's the same thing. If it is then current is current column will become the immediate left column. That's the immediate one I turn. If current column is empty, then ah, this thing is not showing well. Let me bring it up a little. Sorry. Wait, so let me see refuses to come up. One minute, please. I want okay. Okay, let's end this. Okay, I will expand it again, but for us to see what is written there. If current column is empty, then stop. Else, go to step three again. Well, I don't want to waste my time there. I know 200% that you know what is going on. It's just for you to read it and understand the social, uh, and understand how the computer will be shifting. Four plus eight, if it's less than 10, write it down. If it's greater, then remove 10 from it. The remainder, put it down and carry that one. Put it here again and repeat the same. That's what I'm saying. I repeat the same. So I don't expect uh, here to be difficult to understand. Okay, I move to the next slide. Um, notations too. There are notations that um, uh, you can also use. Um, assignment notation, this arrow, like A, B, and the arrow, depending on the direction of the arrow. In this case, the arrow is facing to the left. 
Well, yes, in computer science, it always faces the left, sorry, unless you are draw drawing. It means the value of B, assign it to A. If B is 10, that means A is now equal to 10. If B is 25, that means A should now be equal to 25. Sorry. So we're assigning the value of B to A. The arithmetic notations, you know what is plus, you know what is minus, you know what is um, multiplication, and you know what is division. The computer chips is already knows this already. You don't need to tell computer what is plus, what is minus. When you're writing your program, when you're coding, you don't need to tell computer these. The computer already knows this because it was manufactured with this. It knows this, it's in each chip. In its CPU, understand what plus sign means. CPU, understand what this arrow means. It understand what division means. Logical notations, the computer understands all this. This means equal sign. This is the sign I was telling you. If you write A here and B here, it means A is less than or A is equal to B. Here it means uh, inequality. That is A is not equal to B, depending on where A is and where B is. Here is a less than sign. This is greater than sign. And all that logical notation, these are what the computer understands. It understands you don't need to explain it to the computer. Now, simple addition. Uh, um, having written down this, we know now how we are adding. Now, how do you explain it now to the computer for it to understand? The computer will now, yes, you said that if you add, 10 is greater, move on, it is it. So, Remember, when you are adding numbers, computer has only two numbers at a time. It cannot add three. So you set out variables that will present the first number, V1, and the second number, V2. These are the inputs. Then computer will also need sum. It's another input the computer will need. Yes, you will ask me, how can computer need sum when it has not added? Initially, the sum will be zero. Uh, see this arrow? It was a mistake here. This zero here. Please look, this zero here should be on top here, meaning that initially our sum is assigned the value of zero. So these are the inputs, the program we need. The first variable, that the first number you want to, uh, want to add, the second number you want to add, and the sum. From there, it will pick on. So number two step, the first number is 1,234. Number three step, the second number is 5,678. Now, our new sum will be this, V1 plus V2. An arrow should be here. I did not put, I did not arrange this way, but if you check where there's an arrow hiding here, this arrow should be here. It means assign this value to this variable. There's also should be arrow here, meaning the new sum will now take the value of V plus V2. If you add what you get, this is the sum. So our output will be this sum. So you have this, you have this V1, V2. These are the two numbers you're adding. You get the sum. This sum is the what your program will give you as output. This is the you know, overall picture of what the system needs. But then when you go inside, what is V1 plus V2? How will the computer do it? That was what we did in the previous two pages behind. This is it. How is going to add? The first line here is V1. The second number here is V2. It adds. So whatever it gets becomes the sum. But our initial sum is zero. OK. Um, that's a, uh, another uh, programming example for you, the class, uh, to add the first 10 numbers. I've purposely been using the same example so that the team will uh, go deep into your, <laughs> into your brain. Now you have to plan it first. Um, this is the problem you want to solve, guys. So listen very carefully. This is the problem you want to solve. Maybe you have written this down on the paper. Now you have to create a model. I'm following that diagram now. Problem definition, problem analysis. I assume I've analyzed that, okay, the program, we need these variables. One, two, three, four, two, ten. And the, what am I writing the sum? Okay, now we're going to um, creating a model. So we write the mathematical model. Remember, where you hear of model, it's equation, mathematics. So that mathematical model, all of you know the sign, this sign here. This sign is summation sign. And it means you add from number one to number 10. The sum is what we get here. So anything you get here, 
become the sum, assign it as S. This is the mathematical model, you've written it down. So let's plan. Uh, let n be the number of natural numbers. That's the natural number, there are 10 of them. The sum, you uh, assign SUM as the sum. When you add one plus two, the sum. You add again to three, the sum. You add again to four, the sum, etc. And the I, we let it be the correct number we are in. If you're adding one, one is the I. If you're adding two, two is the I. If you're adding three, three is the I. We are, if you're adding seven, seven is the I at that moment. Now we initialize all the variables. So we know what n is, is 10. The sum initially is zero, and the, the current number is one. So having defined the problem, having written down a mathematical model for it, and having defined the procedure to follow this, the algorithm, we now look at how it will look like. Uh, wait, let me go back a little. Check what is written down, 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 down on red. There is a question there. Why did we initialize? See, why did we initialize? We said initialize all variables. N is 10, sum is 0, I is 1. Why did we initialize? So you check your page 83 and 84 to know why we initialize these variables. If we had not initialized, then maybe our sum will not be correct. Maybe in the memory, someone has already worked with N, and that person allocated N as 20. And when you start adding, it will be using the end that was left in the memory. So it's better you initialize yours so that the one that was in the memory will be deleted. I now, you now have your new end and new sum and new i. So that's just a brief of it. But read this, those pages, it's 384. Okay. So that's it. Initial, um, I initialize it and give it one sum, give it zero. And the uh, uh, sum will be changing initially zero plus the i, which is one. You will get this. Take your time, go through it. You will understand it. Nothing here is hard. I'm telling you, nothing here is hard. So if in the question exam, and they say that uh, below, uh, can you pick from option A, B, C, D, E, which of the algorithms solves um, or add the first natural numbers? Which of the algorithms has the first odd numbers from 0 to 10? Which of the uh, procedures multiplies the first even the first 10 odd numbers? A, D, B, D, E, none of the above. Sometimes it could be none of the above. If the problem is not specific, you see how the trick is coming? Nobody is coming to tell you, is the problem specific? That is your own headache. We give you a problem and the answer. You check whether the problem is specific. If it's not specific, then you cannot say you have the answer. If I say add the first even numbers, where are you starting? Because even numbers is also towards the left. That's where the problem is. Or if we say maybe add the first natural even numbers, or add the first 10 even numbers that are greater than 26. So it's now more specific. All right. Now a flow chart, and I think we are coming to the end. Flow chart is also a diagram. It shows you, you know, visually how the problem is going to be solved, how the problem is being solved. Shows you visually, and in most places, in most industries, flow chart is a must. Yes, when you start creating your model mathematically, those ones are <laughs> compulsory, but flow chart helps you to plan better. And once you've planned and you're giving your programmer the flow chart, the programmer will be able to pick from there. So it's a graphical representation of your program showing the sequence of functions that are to be performed or are being performed. It helps you to easily understand, you know, what is written by someone else. That's what I said now. If you write a program, uh, you want a program to be written, you give it to a programmer. When a programmer looks at your flow chart, he or she will be able to tell what you want to achieve. And, uh, you know, a flow chart, it's been long I left secondary school. So, but I want to just put, say one thing and believe that it is true. That in secondary school, um, the, um, you guys did flow charts. I don't know under which subjects, uh, but I believe that um, maybe you got it, you did it maybe in mass. Maybe if you did some computer science, if you did computer science in secondary school, you must have done flow chart. At least the diagram you must have seen it. Then it's in physics too, for other courses, for other topics in physics. 
flowchart is there. So flowchart is like everywhere. Uh, in medicine, flowchart is very, very well there. Uh, medicians, um, um, sorry, I'm calling them medicians, doctors and other medical professionals, they use it to plan their treatment strategy. If we test him and the temperature is high, give him this drug. If the cholesterol is not above this, place him on this therapy. If this is this, do this. It's a flow chart. And you see the diagram and you'll understand better. So flow chart is not just native to computer science. It's native to most industries in most courses because it helps to make you easily understand what the program is all about. Okay. And there are symbols that make up the flow charts. Um, please don't mind this thing I wrote. It's just following me in each... Uh, in each uh, slide, this blue something I wrote. I wrote it earlier, so it's just following me along. Uh, don't pay attention to it. Those, uh, these 21 or zero I wrote here, don't pay attention. Just focus on the slide. It will not be there later. So the symbols of a flow chart, you have the oval shape. It uh, shows the starting and stopping point of your system. The st starting and stopping point of the problem you are solving. The rectangle always shows the process being performed. Don't worry, this is sounding like Latin to you, but you will see an example and you'll understand. Um, this, this is rhombus, I think. Rhombus um, denotes when decision is being taken. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I add? Do I subtract? Do I stop? Do I continue? Decision. Then this is, I think, called parallelogram. That's where you get your input and your output. And this is like predefined process. It's like some of some processes that's already defined. You are not the one defining it, they're already defined and they are stated there. And the last one there is the connector. It shows the relationship between these symbols. These are by far not all the symbols that make up a flow chart. The problem you are solving determines the kind of flow chart you are going to have. Some flow charts might not have the connector, some flow charts might not have predefined process. But every flow chart must have a starting and stopping point. Every flow chart, I, I, I must believe, must have a process. And every flow chart must have a decision. Input, of course, and output is there. But not all have uh, the last two symbols, with the process and connector. So the flow chart, again, I come, it helps you to visualize, understand what the program is all about, what the problem is all about, and the structure, how it's going to be solved, the logical sequence of the problem. See an example. I repeat again, don't pay attention to that blue 21 and zero and C I wrote. I wrote it earlier, so it keeps on following us. I'm saying this, when you start watching this video in the next one week, you might not remember this thing I'm saying now. So what the video I hear that I'm saying it now, don't pay attention to those zeros and 51 on your right. So um, it's the same problem adding 10 natural numbers. Remember the oval shape is what? Starting and ending point. So we start here. We move on. The rectangle is what? Um, process. Let me go back and show you again in case you have forgotten. See the rectangle. It shows process. So the rectangle is the process and the process is what? Initializing I to be one. We are starting from one. The sum at that current moment is zero. The rhombus is decision making. Decision making. So it says that if I is greater than 10. Is I greater than 10? If it is yes, stop the addition. If it is less than 10, move on. Less than 10, see no. Is I, this is a question, is I greater than 10? If yes, stop. If no, you move on to the next. And the next again is a rectangle, which is another process you add. These things we have done it, ladies and gentlemen. The process is said we have done it. We just inserted it into the flow charts. So since we are adding 10 natural numbers, the first 10 natural numbers, that's why we are saying greater than 10. Assuming we are adding a... I'm asking you a question now. Um, assuming we are adding the first positive even numbers. The first positive even numbers. Okay, let's say the first five positive even numbers. Add the first five positive even numbers. Here we have rhombus, what will be I? If is I 
greater than what? Write it on the chat. Let me see. The question, the problem we want to solve is we are adding the first five positive. What did I say? Is it positive numbers or positive even numbers? Sorry, we said first five positive even numbers. We are adding the first five positive even numbers. Is I greater than what? Thank you, Ola Jumoke. You are right. If is I greater than 10, not five. Everybody writing five. The positive, first five positive uh, even numbers are what? Two, four, six, eight, ten. So is I greater than 10? You are adding them. Oh, you are not counting one, two, three, four. You are adding them. You are adding two. If you add two, you add four. You add six. You add eight. You add 10. So you are adding 10 is the last one. So if this rhombus is telling us that if what I you are adding is greater than 10, then stop because you are you are you are asked to add the first five of them stop if it is less than 10 continue adding until it is greater than 10 once it's greater than 10 stop see if it is greater than 10 stop if it is less than 10 you continue adding and if you add see this arrow it's like a um, logical flow shows you where to continue again if it is less than 10 you come again Less than 10, you come and then once it's greater than 10, you stop. This is a flow chart. Let me give another example and see whether you'll be able to get this. I will now be looking at the YouTube guys. I want to hear your own answer. If the question is add uh, the first positive odd numbers, so the first three positive odd numbers, the first three positive odd numbers what would our decision here in the rhombus be is i greater than what youtube here we come let me go and view the youtube is i greater than what we are adding the first positive three odd numbers the first three positive odd numbers. So this um, uh, is I greater than what? Greater than five, correct. Greater than five. Now I've given you this one, you're not shining and scattering it. Be ready, be ready, ready, ready for harder ones. So this is a flow chart. So if you, if you give a program at this, or you give another person third party this, you will be able to understand what you are doing. Okay, you are, he's starting here. The first one is adding, it's one. No, you don't know what the person is here doing. You say, okay, I is one. Okay, what is he doing with I? Okay, I don't know. SUM is what? I don't know. He say he's zero. Okay, let me check here now. He say, if I is greater than zero, stop. Okay, let me choose an 18 now. They say I is one. One is not greater than zero. It is not greater than 10. Okay, let me check what they said. Okay, this is the process here. Yeah, okay, take that I, add it to some, and some, he said it's zero. Okay, take I, add it to zero. I is one, some is zero. One plus zero is what? One. So this new sum is now one. So the new I will be what we ha you had already, which is one plus one. It will give you two. Okay, see this arrow. This arrow says I should come back here. Two. Is two greater than 10? Yes. So, uh, no. So, I have to do this again. We add again. ETC. Until you get a number that is greater than 10, you say stop. So, you stop. Tell your stop. It now tells you the results. Okay. You have another example. The order of a new customer is accepted, provided it is not more than 5,000 Naira. Otherwise, it is referred to a supervisor. An order from a regular customer is always accepted. Now the questions are there. Define the problem, analyze the problem, draw a flow chart. The order of a new customer is like in your shop. Let's say your mom, mama's shop. She says that if anybody's buying anything more than 5,000, call me. 
that's what he's saying. That in order that more than five thousand naira should be referred to a supervisor. So, so if anything is buying, if anybody comes here and is buying anything more than five thousand naira, call me. Oh, hey, sell if it's four thousand, two thousand, one thousand, sell it and record it. But if it's more than five thousand, call me. Then she added again the last sentence. If it's a regular old customer, see you defined it a regular as an old customer. Two of you, you and your mama, you know that this person is a regular customer. Then accept his uh, sell to him. You saw how how she said it. I know some mothers too. If you do it, even if she come back, she might slap you. There. Did I tell you to sell? I share. I told you to sell. Uh, sell uh, don't sell if it's more than five thousand. But you say, mommy, remember you said that it's not a customer. Always sell. So the problem is very clear. It's very very clear. It will not lead to your mama slapping you because she's putting in there always sell. So in your shop, if I come there and say I want to buy something worth less than five thousand, you sell it to me. Or if it's six thousand, you say, wait, let me call my mommy. You call mommy. Mommy say somebody wants to buy six thousand. What do I do? She say, wait, I'm coming. I'm at the backyard. She will come. Then an old man or a regular customer. Sorry, this is old here. It doesn't mean age. You sorry. It means a customer that has been buying from you guys for a long time comes and he wants to buy something worth twenty thousand naira. What you, will you do? You have to sell because your mom says you should sell. You know him. Maybe you know where he lives. You know uh, he's a family friend. So you know that uh, nothing will go wrong. So this is the problem. You define a problem, you analyze the problem, you draw a flowchart. Okay, let me quickly do that. Um, uh, let me go back. In defining the problem, you need to define a problem, which I've been saying now. I mean, finding the problem, this is the problem, and everything is clear. Uh, uh, the last sentence, they did not say, an order from a regular old customer is accepted. You say, you say it's always accepted. Because if you don't say always accepted, then it's now under question mark. Mommy, do I sell or do I not sell? Do I sell to somebody who have been buying from us for five years? Five years is it? You know, different questions will come. But once they always accepted, that's all. You analyze the problem. Uh, from analyzing the problem, you need to know the inputs. The inputs are what? You have to check if I is less than 5,000 sell. If I is greater than 5,000, what do you do? Then you draw your flowchart. So the flowchart is what we just drew now, we, uh, that you are just seeing. Don't pay attention to the stuff I wrote in blue. So uh, oval shape is always starting. You must start with an oval shape. Uh, you check customer status. See, see these logical arrows. You check the customer status. Is the customer a new customer? Is he a new customer? Yes. Let me stop here and let me go here. If he, is he a new customer? No. Accept his order. Remember, you said that if he's a regular old customer, always accept. So you check. Is he a new customer? No, it's not a new customer. What do you mean by no, it's not a new customer? It means that he is a regular old customer. Then accept his order. You don't have anything to do with the amount. Accept his order. Okay, let's go towards this side. Is he a new customer? Yes. Then there are two conditions you have to check. Rombus is decision making. Remember, here is not a process. This is decision taking. You check whether okay, it's a new customer. Therefore, let me check whether his order is five thousand. Is the order five uh, more than five thousand? If it is yes, then refer it to your mom, to your mama, call your mama. But if the order is the the, the question is, is the order uh, greater than five thousand? Is greater? Call your mama. If it is not, then accept the order. That is the flow chart. It's very simple, you'll understand it. Uh, it's not something hard. Just take your time and read, you will understand it. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. Normally I will say, do you have questions? But I'm not gonna ask it here. And I will be surprised if you have so many questions. So if you have questions, you channel it to your uh, uh, course reps. Your course rep will compile it. I don't want course rep to be coming here 20 times in a day. To compile the question must not necessarily be today. You can send it across to me tomorrow or next. And you must not necessarily come physical. You might come, I'm not around. You might find a way. So I'm giving you that assignment, you cost rep. Find a way to get across to me with the question. The little is for there. If you get across any medical lab student, you should be able to reach me with questions. If I don't answer your question, then I remember, uh, um, then note that to me is, 
it's a useless question to, to start with. So ask questions that, that relates to what we went through today. Next week, you're now going to proper programming in Visual Basic. The lecturer will take you through uh, what and what is expected of you to know and what and what you should know in order to help you pass your exams. So for those who joined late, especially on YouTube, or those who did not hear initial announcements, I said make sure you, you get the manual book from the books or from the books shop, or preferably from our department, computer science department. Um, it's in high supply here. Uh, don't because it's 4K, you rush to back head of black markets and buy black markets, they are selling and they have always killed students. We'll always know. Uh, when something was printed, even if it is not photocopy, even if it is colored, we will know. Trust me, we will know. The danger is that you will not be told when <laughs> your workbook will be thrown away. That's the danger. You will not be told. And you just sit there and think that you've submitted. Secondly, course reps to save you from stress. Make sure you have your attendance and you find anybody that submits. The date of submission is written in that message. And please, if you've gotten it, please reshare it again for the new students. So we actually have not seen it. But you that is actually have not seen it. Are you sure you talk to your classmates? Are you sure you talk with your classmates? Talk to them, ask them what is going on. Physics, what's up? What's going on? Are they giving us assignments? Is there anything we are submitting? Make sure you ask. You don't just sit and say you don't know. Why others know? So how come others know you don't know? Let's this is the first time you are coming. Fine. If this first time you are coming, then make sure you ask. Ask for each course what they are doing, especially assignments. Have any assignment we submitted before, especially the badge B. Uh, but to my knowledge, I know the instructions given to lecturers that no assignment should be done until badge B has been registered. That was before strike. Two. So I can say with certainty that most lecturers did not give any assignment or have not collected any assignment because of badge B students that we are coming. But if you are and they told you that ah, we did assignment so with this year, it was marked, so we did lab. Then the next person you have to meet is your course, your supervisor. And they tell him or her your predicament. Definitely, you are not the only person. In the department, you will be at least up to five, six newcomers coming in. You tell them your predicament, then the supervisor will direct you on what to do. Don't sit down and expect that miracle will happen. It will not happen. If you did not take tests, you did not take exam, sorry, CA or lab, that they marked, then you better take action with respect to that. Maybe the lecturer might be approachable. You go and meet the lecturer, explain. If the thing is becoming too much for you, you now meet your supervisor because you don't have to be rushing to your supervisor for any small thing. There are some little things, some of you are smart that you can meet your supervisor and he will, so you can meet the course lecturer and he will oblige and listen and know, okay, you are the new part. There is no lecturer in Unilag today that doesn't know about Batch B students. So if one has taken already and it is proven that you are Batch B, they will uh, attend to you. I've had one lecturer that said, but well, not in science, yeah, in management science, I told the student that the assignment given is here by canceled because of the new students. So you find your way, don't dull around. Um, what next? Then the assignments, I pasted it and I begged those that have gotten the uh, notification to share it again to their fellow colleagues. Maybe in your group, share it again, please. The videos, I've already shared it both on YouTube and on Zoom. The lecture videos for lecture one, lecture two, up to lecture six. Lecture seven, once this is through now, I think the link you have for YouTube, that's lecture seven. The link you are watching now for YouTube, that's lecture seven. So I don't need to share it again, but assuming one thing or the other, uh, something there to the other, and you are not able to watch the video again, you let me know through someone that knows someone that knows someone that knows someone that knows me. I will share it again for lecture seven, but for lecture one, lecture six, the full lecture is there. So sit down, listen to it, say lecture two, especially for the badge B, so that you wouldn't complain that you started late. So um, that's it. Do so you have any questions? with respect to what we talked today, send it to your course first. But if you have any administrative question, you can, okay, someone pasted the assignment here. Very good, thank you. If you have any other administrative question, I don't think you should have, but if you have, then you, uh, you need your course uh, supervisors. Then for medical students, particularly, so I've always been doing with medical students, all of you, 
medical lab, um, the MBB, uh, S guys, uh, physiotherapy, radiology, etc. My advice, do every assignment given to you. I put my, ear, my hand on the air. That's how my dad used to advise me when I was small. Even now, he always tell me like this, do assignments given to you. Zoology, make sure you submit. Cis, make sure you submit. Zoology, make sure you submit. Make sure you buy when others are buying. If you don't have money, come in front of faculty of science and start begging for money. Write in your, on your chest here, please help a student in need. Nobody listens to this. So I don't have money. So I came late. So I this and that. Nobody told me. Nobody listens to that too. So make sure it's hard. I know it's easy for me to say get money, but try and get money and buy these things they are buying and submit. Uh, it's not like in some state schools where a lecturer personally is selling. Most of the books you are going to buy is sold by a department. So don't waste your time going to report somewhere. Hey, sir, they are asking us to pay 4000 Now you, Sadi, we are selling it in bookshop. Bookshop is official. And we are selling the department. The department is official. You are not giving me the money. You are giving it to someone else. And it's for the department, not for a particular lecturer. So try and make sure the medical students, try and make sure you do your assignments. And of course, in exam, good luck. Make sure, <laughs> forget about F. Ask your colleagues, those in year one at Yara, what happened recently. Ask those in year two, what happened is, ask those in year three, ask those in year four, final year students, ask them. Will you understand what I mean? That you shouldn't have F. Once you have F, I don't want to say what will happen. So that you don't go and kill yourself. And on the paper, you write it there, Dr. Wiri killed me. No. So, but read, make sure you submit assignments. Assignments are very, very key. And they don't copy. You will not be there when we'll be deciding whether you copy it or not. So run away from copy. Ah, they give us the same assignments. Oh, yeah, make I copy your own. You copy. Now, now you take your own uh, uh, workbook, put it at the back. The person you copy from on the front so that by the time lecture goes through this one, down, 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 you'll not remember again at the same time. We are young like you. We understand all this. And people making it are mini. So we go, no. Don't copy. Try to do it yourself. And uh, even if you must copy, don't copy the person's name and matric number. Be smart. Uh, and if things seem to be copy, 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 then you can never get a very high mark. Because if it is everything, everybody's copying the same thing. You, know, you never get a high mark. So once you have your assignments, okay. Then the rest are sure that your scores at least will be relatively okay, generally in the courses. But the CAs are mainly over 30, some are doing over 20. So do, do give two CAs, attend your labs. This is directly, I'm, I'm addressing the medical students. Because many of you did not cross. Those in 100 level, in the 200 level, now they did not cross. They are came back. They are now being uh, spread in different different departments because one thing or the other led to them getting F. Some did not submit one thing, or some submitted everything, you no. Know, but in exam they failed, or they did not do well, or they were not able to, you know, meet up with the exam. They did late, or they did one thing or the other. So as you do this, also pray that your village people will not remember you pass and go so thank you for the lecture and thank you for your attention questions you send it to your post rep and i will try to uh okay someone says sir should we print wait let me read sir should we print out the assignment and paste it on our workbook or write it down with a pen sir should we print out the assignment and paste it on our workbook or write it down with a pen the same 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 now someone was asking me that question yesterday and um Traditionally, so write with pen, with pencil, reason, so that when they are cleaning, if they can clean it, if you write with pen, you will not be able to clean. Unless you write it on a paper, and then through the paper, you now copy it back. But then when we mark, we've seen students attaching paper to inside the wall. Fine, you are free to attach. If maybe the space will not be enough, you are free to attach. You indicate your son name, your machine number on the paper, attach it, make sure you staple it well, and make sure you fold it well so that it will go inside, inside the workbook where, where is it? And make sure the workbook when you are putting it inside is bought from the department or from the book, so not from somewhere. So yes, you are free and you are free to use pencil uh, if it's so necessary or pen. Pen is allowed, pencil is allowed. So that's it. I can't be reading all the questions there, but I believe, so I should wait. Please, sir, can you explain this last again? Which one last again? Uh, 
we can pass that should last slide oh someone is saying i should explain this last slide see okay let me explain it although it's past 10 already um the problem was what the problem is let me use the example that you that is asking me this question will understand let me not look at what the, the problem is your mom has a shop we are on strike and you are not happy that we are on strike. You want to come to school and the world's closing around. But your mom said, today not today, you will stay in my shop. She gives instruction that if anybody wants to buy anything more than 5,000, call me on the phone. Don't sell. But if the person is buying anything less than 5,000, you can sell. That's the problem. Now, we want to uh, illustrate this problem in a flow chart. Now, for you to illustrate in a loop flow chart, you should first know the components of a flow chart, the shapes, what they mean. Over shape means the starting point. You can also use over shape in stop. Rectangle means um, procedure, procedure you will take. Rhombus means decision taking stage. Rhombus can appear at any step. Oh. It doesn't mean that once you have start, the next one must be uh, the next one rectangle, the next one rhombus. They can interchange depending on the problem particular you are solving. So let's start. So we start the, the we start solving the problem. A customer came to your shop. Your mama has given you instructions and has left. Maybe the shop is in front of the house. She has entered inside the parlor. A customer came. Now the customer wants to buy. Let me just use concrete example. The customer wants to buy milk. Milo, sugar, everything total is about seven thousand naira. Okay, um, okay. Before I go into that, the last instruction your mom gave you before entering. Remember, the mom said, if someone is buying anything more than five thousand, don't sell. Call me on the phone. But if it's less than five thousand naira, go ahead and sell. Then the last one before she enters, she said, if it is our old regular customer, old is not age. I mean, the person I've been buying from you for the past five, six, seven, ten years. A regular customer. If it is from a regular customer, always attend to him or her. That's the instruction your mom told you. If it's a regular customer, always attend to him or her. She can actually not say any other thing. But the other one says, if it's a new customer, check. If it is more than 5,000, call me. If it's less than 5,000, you sell to the person. Fine, she left. A customer came. You have not seen him before. And uh, he wants to buy Milo, Bonfita, uh, sorry, Bonfita they used to use before, Milo, milk, sugar, etc., clothes, and everything total up to 7,000 naira. So see, your, see the new, you are checking whether the, you are checking the customer status. See where I'm pointing. You are checking the customer status. Now, is he a new customer? I'm asking you now, you that is listening to me, is he a new customer? Uh, when I was saying, I said a customer came, you have not seen him before. That means it's a new customer. Nobody will carry it and tell you open like that it's a new customer. That means it's a new customer. Okay. The rhombus is checking to take decision. Is it a new customer? Yes or no? Yes. It's a new customer. Now the next check. What is buying? Is it more than 5,000 or less than 5,000? Is it more than 5,000? Yes, it is more than 5,000. We say that it's buying something worth 7,000. So refer it to your mom. Call your mom. Mama, somebody wants to buy something more than 5,000, your mom will run out, come and attend to the person. That is it. The problem solved. Another customer comes again. I'm using three different customers. First customer, another customer comes again. You check. I have not seen this person before. So it's a new customer. He wants to buy something. He just wants to buy sweets, 50 naira. So 50 naira is less than 5,000. So that's uh, first you check it's a new customer or not a new customer. Yes, it's a new customer. You now check how much is buying. Is it less than 5,000? Yes. Okay, sorry, here, is it greater than 5,000? No, it is not greater than 5,000. See the no. See the arrow. Now, assets. That is sell to him or her. That's the second um, customer. The third customer comes. Say, ah, Daddy Ayeni, good afternoon, sir. How are you, sir? How is family? That means it's an old regular customer. What can we do for you, sir? So you are checking the customer here, whether it's a regular customer. Is he a new customer? No, he's not a new customer. Daddy, what can I do for you? I want to buy this, this, this. Uh, that is total is five, um, 26,000 naira. So, okay, no problem, I will pay. You didn't call your mom because your mom uh, left specific instruction that, um, 
to a new regular customer. So that is it. I've explained it and I hope you understood it well. No, it is C. It is not um, the question. I like this question. So isn't the chat incomplete without the stop? The stop must not always be there because it's a continuous process. Customers will keep on coming. Customers will keep on coming. And you see where you direct the customer, it ends. You direct the first customer, you call your mom. Mom handles it. Well, okay, okay. Granted, granted, though. See, um, let me draw another thing, maybe to make things better. Let me draw. Someone asked whether this thing is complete without the stop. So to avoid, okay, see me drawing now. Let me put drawing in here. I'm putting arrow. This is oval. Stop. The same here. So correct. Let me accept that. You also write stop here. Sorry, I'm drawing with a keypad, so it's hard for me. Okay. I think that should be clear now. Wait, so I'm trying to check. All right. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. So someone asked, are we supposed to put our passport? <laughs> someone asked me that yesterday. I laughed, say yes, but don't go and announce that Dr. Way say you should be putting passport. If you have passport to spare, put fine. If you have put, if you have a passport to spare, put it on the workbook, fine. Nobody will penalize you for not put after all they wrote their passport picture. Put, yes, if you want, if you have. But make sure you put your matric number, you put your details. So if you have passport to spare, and especially on the level, you did registration. So I believe you still have some passport uh, photograph remaining. Yes, attach it. Attach it there, put your matric number, write your full name. Okay. All right, guys, with the absence of any other question. I uh, will call it a day today. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Thank you very much. And all the best as you prepare for exams very soon. And they stop complaining that sorry, they didn't give us time. We ask, well, Bachi, I understand, Sha. You, that is Bachi, uh, uh, remember, the first strike, we had like three weeks or so remaining before exams. So it's the same three weeks you are getting. Nobody rushed you. Nobody was saying, so they could have given us two months, three months. Which two months, three months? Remember, before you went on strike, uh, it was winning that um, amount of weeks, and then there was sports. That's a uh, uh, Nuga games. And you guys were supposed to start exam, I think, if, I, if I'm correct, immediately after Nuga games or a week after Nuga games. So it's the same which you are getting now. So those that should even be complaining about the batch B, not you, the batch A. But uh, surprisingly, the batch A ones are the ones disturbing, saying that I've been giving them enough time. So, and it's expected that within eight months, you must have uh, uh, read your books and not getting married. Or do you know that thing? You must have read your book somehow now. Yes, done other um, source like developing yourself, attending to courses, registering, enrolling for online courses, but at least you must have read your book. So good luck with your exams. Thank you very much. I'm ending the um, translation now, both in you on YouTube. The link you have, I'm not addressing it to people on Zoom. The YouTube link, Take it from those on YouTube. There are more. You guys only 300. The rest are there. Take it from them and uh, watch the video for lecture seven. Thank you very much. And uh, all the best. Bye-bye.